Uh, welcome, Doctor uh, Mark Kanyan. We look at you as a person who have uh, experience in uh, a large set of countries mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. from Finland, Costa Rica, uh, China, uh, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, moved around quite a bit. And uh, when we look at the whole literature of uh, in, uh, forestry, it is uh, there's a high bias on uh, information which we have from temperate forests rather than the uh, tropical forests. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the whole literature, yes. So whenever we think of uh, policy making or making some generalization out of it, it always goes in the bias towards uh, what we know from the temperates. Have you experienced that sort of a issue when you are using data from uh, multiple countries? I think that for the policy making purposes, it is important that we have institutions in the South, like your institution or the institutions that I have been working with in the past, the, the CATI, the Costa Rican organization, or the CIFO, the CIFO, which is international organization, because they can have their own ways of communicating to the policy makers, and they, don't, they are not pay only relying on the, let's say, traditional scientific uh, ways of publishing. The scientific publishing, unfortunately, is very much biased toward the North. And that's also reflected in some, let's say, science policy interface processes like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that I have been part of for, for more than 20 years. Because the panels like these, they use publications that are published in journals. And unfortunately, the, the publishing process is very much biased towards the people from the North. But for instance, what I experienced in C4 is that if C4 wants to get a message in, in terms of forest policy to the policymakers in the tropics, there are other ways of doing it. Having more interaction with the policymakers directly in those countries or through uh, local, uh, let's say, NGOs, local uh, institutions, uh, local press. So what I'm saying is that it is unfortunate that it is. It is, it is changing. We are already seeing, uh, I have seen some statistics about, for instance, the role of, of India, China, Brazil in scientific publication. That's already going up. <coughs> when considering the literature published from South, mm -hmm. especially the tropical forest yes. context, how far do you think the Indian scenario is covered or the data accessibility, availability, is, is it sufficient for the policy making? Well, I mean, the question is, is always what is sufficient. I, I'm a person who feels that we should try to do a policy recommendation whenever we can, and also informing about the uncertainty which is related to our research. It, and, poli and policymakers, they understand. They understand that this is scientific uh, result. It is not absolute truth or truth, in, in absolute truth, but it is, at least it is the best scientific knowledge that we have at this time. And in 10 years or 5 years from now, we may have better scientific knowledge, and then we can improve our, let's say, messages. But I think that we should not go into the situation where we say that no, we don't know enough, we cannot help, we cannot help the society give us 100 million and 10 years and we come up with the answer. No, we, we should not do that. Okay. We should be able to transmit whatever we know now, the best scientific knowledge, into the policy makers. And uh, if, if you consider that as a process, in, yeah. your, in your career you have uh, made a shift from a basic uh, scientist mm -hmm. uh, into a person who is looking into policy. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So how, what, how was the transition period and how do you look at, uh, look at that transition process now? Well, I mean, it, it was never a kind of a transition period. I, I think that it, it's more kind of a parallel. I see. I mean, I started, uh, I was the director of the Finnish climate change program uh, 20 years ago. And that was already the time when the government was asking us, the scientists, okay, what should we do with our agriculture? What should we do with our forests in terms of climate change? Uh, so it, it, what I'm trying to say is that I never went from science to policy, but I've been trying to do both, being in, in the both kind of way, changing the hat, you know, <laughs> the policy, communicating with the policy makers, but keeping also my scientific activity. Coming to one of the areas in which you are currently writing, yeah. mostly the reduced emission from deforestation, yeah. degradation. Mm -hmm. Now it has undergone a change from RED to RADD. Yes. And red plus is there. Yes. Yes. Uh, can you tell for the general audience what is the difference? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know how long back should I go, but uh, when the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated and it was signed in 1997, this issue of uh, role of forest emissions was already there. But for political reasons, it was taken out from the convention. And now the only forest-related activity that we see in the Kyoto Protocol is afforestation, reforestation. And it was supposed to be avoided deforestation. That was the term that we used at the time. But that was taken out. Then it came up again in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2005. Costa Rica, Papua New Guinea uh, made a kind of a proposal to get it back into the convention. Because simply because the emissions coming from the land use change, they are actually quite large. They are something like 15% of the total emissions of CO2 are coming from the land use change conversion of forest to agriculture mainly. And, and that was the kind of a starting point in, in Bali negotiations in 2007, that it was adopted, and it was adopted as red with two Ds, because looking only the conversion of land from forest to agriculture, people thought that it would be good to look also at the, at the areas that are remaining forests, but are degraded. So the first D is related to the conversion, deforestation, and the second D is related to the forest degradation. degradation. Then the plus came in, in, in Mexico last year, uh, basically because many countries in Africa were saying that, okay, we are not benefiting anything from this because we don't have high deforestation rates or we don't have a lot of uh, degradation in forest, but we have areas that are sparsely, like a savanna type of vegetation, very dry areas, and we want to also benefit from adding carbon to the system. So then the plus came where there are activities that are related to, uh, for instance, they call it enhancement of carbon sinks in forests. So if you go planting trees or doing agroforestry systems or other systems where you are basically adding carbon to the system, could be then compensated through, to, through me, a red mechanism. There are also other aspects. Forest management is now part of this red plus. So people who are doing sustainable forest management, it means that the, the sustainability in terms of carbon stocks, we maintain carbon stocks in the forest, we don't let it go down, so that, that could also be part of the, the red plus mechanism. My only worry now with this, all the pluses and, and all the additions, it, it's getting complex. Yeah. It started with a very simple thing, trying to look at the conversion, deforestation. Now it has two Ds. Now it has one plus. Maybe next year it has the second plus, and whatever. I mean, it is getting to me uh, into a situation it might be very difficult to to handle. Okay. You mean to say that uh, it's getting uh, getting more and more theoretically perfect, but practically impossible? Yeah. I, well, you can you can say it like that. I mean, it is starting to to become a kind of a unif uh, let's say unifying forest policy instrument. And actually, it was aimed to be focused very much on the emissions. Now we are trying to put everything that we can into the red. And I think that it may make the, the real implementation difficult in, in many countries. And when you look at the different scales at which uh, uh, these uh, uh, policies are going to impact, yeah. uh, as you rightly said, that there are countries which are going into big scale planting. Mm -hmm. and they expect the money to come from carbon finances. Mm -hmm. But in the case, this case is quite a bit different in India and Bangladesh, countries which have stabilized uh, mm -hmm. the uh, natural forest area. Yes. Now, uh, India will be quite eagerly looking forward for getting money for uh, maintaining the forest. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, how does that surface? Is it uh, practically coming up or in the whole process where existing forests are, uh, are rewarded from carbon finances? Yeah, and this, this is exactly the complication that I'm trying to say, because the original idea was to reduce emissions. Now, the Red Plus includes the conservation, for instance, maintaining existing forest. But it's not about reducing emissions. It is avoiding the future emissions yes. at some time. So you are doing something which was philosophically not the original idea, because the climate change negotiations are very much focused on emissions trying to get the industrialized countries to reduce their emissions, but also help the developing countries to reduce their emissions through the Red Plus. Now you are basically compensating countries of 
maintaining the forest. I don't know if you get my point. Yeah. It is not related to emissions it anymore. Avoided degradation. It is avoided degradation. So, it's that, coming. Uh, avoided deforestation. deforestation. Yeah. Yeah. So that brings us into a different crisis. Where uh, we mean to say that if you are planting a new forest, mm -hmm. a new, new growth forest, yeah. you get uh, money up for that. But if you have got an old forest, which is full of, uh, mm. of flora yeah. and fauna, which have big diversity is yeah. being maintained, uh, you are not going to pay it for that. No, exactly. The Red Plus can get payments. If, if the Red Plus is implemented like it is now in the Mexico Cancun agreement, you can get payments for maintaining the existing forests. Even if there is no threat of losing it. I see. Because the whole idea of Red the first D, uh, reducing emissions from de deforestation, is that you have to have a baseline scenario where you can show that historically this uh, state, Kerala for instance, has been losing 1% of forest cover each year and it will continue if there is no compensation. Then the industry, international mechanism is going to compensate the, the Kerala state and the farmers here in order to reduce this reduction for forest cover or, st or stop it. That is the avoided deforestation or re reducing emissions from deforestation. Now the Red Plus <coughs> countries like, uh, let's say, um, Papua New Guinea or countries like uh, DRC Congo, which has huge areas of so remote forests that have no danger, at least immediate danger, of being lost. They could even get the compensation now with this plus. Uh, red plus. But it gets comp complex mm. because philosophically, think about the whole climate convention. The idea is that those people who are emitting carbon to the atmosphere get paid, not those people who have the stock of carbon. For instance, if, if I make this uh, kind of a, let's say, analog, uh, we should pay the Arabs of not burning, giving the oil to us to burn. We should, if, if, yeah. I, if you understand what I'm trying yeah. to say, yeah. we are compensating forest that is not going to be destroyed in order to maintain the stocks mm -hmm. there. And that, that is ex exactly the complex system now. We, first we added 1D and now we added the plus and it get, it's getting a real complex. So uh, could you just ex uh, uh, have a look at uh, the whole process of carbon finance which mm. has happened yeah. and how the forest sector missed the bus in the very first instance? I mean, the, the forest, the, the role of forest in the whole carbon finance and market is, is nothing. I mean, there's, there is basically zero. It's zero. If you look at the CDM mechanism that was created in 97 in the Kyoto Protocol, which includes afforestation and reforestation, CDM, uh, through CDM, uh, they have developed approximately 2,000 projects out of which, which 14 or 15 are forestry projects. So it's minimal. Mm. The, uh, the role of forest carbon credits in the whole CDM is 0.1%. It's okay. nothing. So there is, it, it doesn't play any role in, in the current carbon mm -hmm. financing. There is also, of course, the so-called voluntary market, which is yeah. not under the convention. There are a lot of, uh, let's say, companies who are compensating farmers in different parts of the world but that's more kind of a corporate social responsibility or they want to show the yeah. green image of the company and, and they do it. But it's not part of this uh, official mechanism. Does it also mean that within a country, a uh, forestry asset sector is not as uh, uh, perceived, not as important as many other different uh, sectors within a country itself, mm. which has reflected at the international level uh, for not having considered uh, forestry as uh, a big uh, component in the very first go of the carbon tax? Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's one reason. I mean, forestry in many countries, it has it's a very low priority in the governmental agenda or political ag agenda, which is reflected in this. But also there are other things that are, for instance, are behind of the, uh, of the situation why in Kyoto Protocol the forests are not reflected. I mean, it's a political situation. When 97 afforestation and reforestation became part of the Kyoto Protocol, there were some countries and some groups, environmental groups mainly, that they were worried about that industrial countries, instead of reducing emissions in their own country, they go into forestry projects mm -hmm. in the tropics. 
and that's why they made it uh, 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 they made it difficult to do forestry okay. projects. Okay. So there was a different reason for that. That there was it was a political reason of making forestry difficult. Okay. And um, I just wanted to. Uh, it's a curious uh, thing to uh, about to know about Costa Rica, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, already started growing teak and mm -hmm. started uh, yes. exporting teak in a, yeah. a big way. Before that uh, happened in Costa Rica, there was a program called InBio, in which uh, uh, mm -hmm. there was multinational companies had uh, mm -hmm. ownership on uh, the biodiversity yes. of the country, and uh, there was a big flow of money. Uh, from the multinational companies yes. too. And that was proposed as a uh, wonderful model for biodiversity conservation. Mm -hmm. Any observations on that? Yeah, well, I, I just have to remind that I left Costa Rica already uh, eight years ago. So I my experience of Costa Rica might be ten years back. Mm. Uh, they created this INBIO, which is the Institute for Biodiversity. And the idea is was exactly what you said, is to sell some... Uh, let's say properties of, of uh, biodiversity to mainly to medicinal purposes to pharmaceutical companies and the, with that money uh, invest that in protected areas or managing the biodiversity. It is a nice example when I left Costa Rica that was eight years ago there was only initial steps so I, I really and I haven't been following okay. it I cannot say I only know that the the first money that they got never went to the farmers. It stayed in the capital. <laughs> it, it stayed to, it, it stayed to, 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 to strengthen the institution itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked this the directors of the institution why we're doing it. They wanted to strengthen their own capacity and they said that in the future it will go to the, okay. to the farmers. Uh -huh. But I, I haven't seen that, but I, I have to admit mm -hmm. that's uh, 10 years ago. Now, in that case also what you mean to say is that the, the governmental policy and the instruments which are operating are quite critical in how, yes. however good the model is. Yeah, but I, I really have to say now when we are talking about Costa Rica, Costa Rica was the first country in the world to introduce what we call payments for ecosystem services in the forestry law. Yes. That was in 1996. And that has really changed the, the forestry sector in Costa Rica in a way because people can now manage the, or let's say they can get compensated from the society for managing and protecting their forests without selling a product, they are selling a service. For instance, selling a watershed management service. Uh, it, like here in, in many countries, it's very important to have clean water for the human consumption or for agriculture use. And how we manage the, the watersheds, it's very crucial in terms of do we get the clean water or not. And these type of elements were introduced in this Costa Rican law. So they have been pioneers in what we call payments for ecosystem services. Oh, so that payments were within the country? Yes, oh. that's within the country. Okay. And, and uh, the idea of Costa Ricans was that if they avoided deforestation would be part of the Kyoto Protocol, they could get international funding for it. It didn't happen, so they made a system where they take tax from the, from the gasoline, from the, 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 you know, the car drivers, mm -hmm. they pay a tax to the government and that's then going to the farmers for okay. conservation and, and, and management of forests. So you mentioned about ecosystem services being paid in Costa Rica. Yeah. How far we have uh, moved uh, scientifically uh, into measuring or evalu economically evaluating uh, the value of ecosystem services? Well this is, a, this is a kind of a problem but I would say honestly that I don't see that as a barrier. Um, there, are many, there are several opinions among the scientists and I belong to the group that feels that it is, we don't have to know exactly the monetary value of each service in order to compensate. We can make an approximation. Okay. And for instance, the Costa Rica model was based on that. For instance, they are paying the farmer for the carbon sequestration service but they don't measure exactly how many tons of carbon. It's a lump sum okay. estimation. It is, it is not, the, let's say, the, the perfect system in, in scientific okay. terms because you don't know. It is not a real trade. If I, if, I, mean, I sell you a kilo yeah. of bananas, you know yeah. that it will be a kilo. But in this case, I sell you something, but you don't know exactly whether it's one kilo or half a kilo or 1.5 kilo because we have mm. not agreed exactly on the quantity. But still, it is the idea was to compensate the farmers of doing something better than they had done in the past. 
without knowing exactly what is the, the right. better. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, a, that's an interesting way to look at it, which brings us uh, back to the very first question, yeah. where uh, uh, we need an approximation. Mm. And for making that approximation, is the uh, um, northern data going to give a big influence on the approximation process? Or do we have enough measurements in the tropics to have approximations for the uh, tropical area? Yeah, but my, 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 I mean, that's my strong personal feeling that we have enough to start. Okay. We, we cannot say that let's give us 20 years more and then we come up with a solution. That's too late. And that was the Costa Rican idea. Okay. To start with something which is not perfect, but it's better than the past, and then we can do it better at the time. And that's how I, I think that the, the red plus mechanism mm -hmm. should go mm -hmm. as well. For instance, that you give compensation to a country or area for managing forests without knowing exactly. You can say that it's okay, 252 plus minus, you know, there is an uncertainty, like in all the scientific estimations of forest inventory. We know that, okay. but we, and, and it, with the time it gets better. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea. Uh, that the system should be so that you, are, you cannot cheat, you cannot sell something that you don't have. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know exactly, you can make a conservative estimate. And that's the idea of conservatism. If you know what I'm trying to say, you take a lower bar of the lower end of the standard deviation. Okay. That's the conservative okay. estimate. It's not optimistic. Mm -hmm. If you take the upper part of the standard deviation, you're optimistic. You can okay. always take the lowest part. And then, for instance, if you say that you have 100 tons of carbon, plus minus 10. I said, okay, I pay you 90, because it's plus minus 10. And that's a conservative okay. value. And then next year, when you can say that, yes, but my plus minus is only five, you have improved your system. Okay. You can get five units more money from me okay. because you have improved your system. Okay. So I, what I feel that the system doesn't have to be perfect to start, yeah. but there is a motivation to get improved yeah. because you can get more payments oh, for yeah. that. It can be refined in the process. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. Does it su suggest anything for us in KFRA that to, which are the areas in which we would like to open up research? Or wow, I, <laughs> I think that you, you are, I mean, looking at your institution, you are doing so many things already. And I, I, I just don't, I cannot recommend, I don't know enough to, to recommend that. I just only can I, can, I can recommend, like in this meeting that we have here, is to maintain and increase your international links collaboration with different parts of the world. The, what I've seen here today, we have people from different parts of the world. We all, all learn from that. I think that that's a very good way of, of uh, you know, uh, getting uh, information and exchanging, exchanging ideas. Yeah. One, uh, uh, maybe one last question. Yeah, okay. uh, 20 years is a pretty long period, the, the time at which we had been uh, involved with the climate change. Mm -hmm. things. And even at this point of time, there are many people in the world who have not even heard about uh, the word climate change. Mm -hmm. But then during the 20 years, the visibility has increased, a series of conventions have happened. But uh, as a person who have very closely followed the whole process, what is your personal feel about the journey and uh, the future? No, that, that's a tough question. I'm, I'm optimist, <coughs> but I'm, I'm also realist. So for instance, I unfortunately, I, I, I see that there is lack of uh, political interest now in, in, in to tackle these big issues because they are, I mean, policy makers or, or politicians in the world, they don't really think about future generations, they think about their own re-election or the next, you know, five years that they have their office and very much concerned about the economical crisis and so on and so on. But we should think about really about the future generations. I mean, the real heart of the sustainability issue. And if we do that, then we understand the climate change is, is important. But uh, unfortunately, that's, that's not everywhere. Even in the big countries of the world, I mean, I don't want to mention names, but the biggest countries of the world, they are still don't agree that we should have some kind of a climate change convention or, or that. So, yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of things to do. But I think that the, the awareness is, is getting you know, it, it's going, coming up all, yeah, all, sure. all around mm -hmm. the world. It is, it is honestly, uh, for, for younger generations, thinking about our children and grandchildren, I mean, we should not do this for them. We should really think about